There's a line in Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them that I think about a lot. When our heroes go to a magic speakeasy in 1920s New York, Tina Goldstein, the wizard cop, says this. I've arrested half of the people in here. And like... What? start with the obvious and say that this is a really embarrassing thing to say to somebody. If I was hanging out at a bar with one of my friends and they said, I've arrested half of the people in here, uh, I would ask them to leave because it sucks. And I also just found out they were a cop. It's one of those boasts a child makes that's clearly a lie. Like saying, I once ate 50 hot dogs. No, you didn't eat 50 hot dogs. The world record is 76. You are not among the upper echelons of hot dog eaters. It would have been in the paper. What's funny is that Tina actually thinks this is a cool thing to say. Look at her face. Are you trying to impress him? It's kind of adorable. But Newt is a Sigma Chad, so he just pretends not to hear it and immediately asks a very dark personal question. You can tell me to mind my own business, but I saw something in that death potion back there. I saw you hugging that second Salem boy. Well done. Great job. If the film wants us to like Tina, then having her gleefully smile while bragging about how many people she arrested isn't the best way to do it. And if she's lying, then that's some American psycho levels of sus. Either way, Tina, I hate you. All cops are bogus. But also, what are you talking about? I've arrested half of the people in here? What does that even mean? Sing me a wizard song, something wicked this way comes. Sing me a wizard song, I sing it all day long. I love you, I need you, I can't get you out of my bed. I scream till I'm hoarse and oh boy, I show you it's dead. Sing me a wizard song, something wicked this way comes. Sing me a wizard song. I'm gonna sing it all day long. La 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 la. La 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 da. La 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 la. La 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 la. Tina Goldstein is a member of Magical Congress. Now, I know that makes it sound like she's a senator or something, but no, she's actually just a cop, or an uh, ex-cop. See, she used to be an Auror, which, as best as I can understand, is like Wizard FBI. It's that thing Harry Potter becomes in those books. You know, the ones made by the world's most pre-made oatmeal. But Tina made a goof and got demoted to wand permits because, you know, as a cop, it's basically impossible to get fired. So that means that all of these arrests that happened at this bar must have been when she was still in the Wizard FBI. Unless she is just arresting people for expired wand permits, uh, which would be very funny. Also, like, what the hell are wand permits? Is that like Wizard DMV? That's, that honestly rocks. Now, I'm just imagining someone getting pulled over for not having their wand permit up to date, and this guy's like written Article 30 of the Magic Constitution on it in red, and it says he's a sovereign citizen and can't be tried by wizard law. Like he's got a bunker with 30 unlicensed wands, and Magical Congress can't do anything about it because of like the uh, stick lobby. No way, you wouldn't register wands at the Wizard DMV. You'd have to go through the Wizard Bureau of Firearms. You don't travel with wands, okay, except when you teleport, which you used your wand for. So it's like a gun and a car. It's a gun car. The hell was I talking about? It's not clear what the Wizard FBI does. Best I can understand is they're like men in black for magic. You know, making sure people don't find out that sorcery is real or whatever. So if that was Tina's job, that's probably what she arrested the people in the bar for. She's not a beat cop making rounds around Brooklyn. At least I don't think she is. Do they have beat cops in the wizarding world? They have federal officers for sure, we know that, but are there cops making sure that wizards, like, don't rob banks or punch a child? Because human cops can't arrest them. They're wizards. They have the powers of God. Who gives parking tickets to God? 
I think they just have one kind of police and they're all in magical Congress and they deal with everything. Ours are just all the cops all the time, which is terrifying and I hate that I thought about that. They have one entity in charge of international terrorism and making sure like a hippogriff isn't caught by a dog catcher. No wonder a guy could just come in and poof a dude and become Wizard J. Edgar Hoover. Folks are stretched thin, it's all get out. Who has time for background checks or uh, body checks? You, you know how hard it is to check if someone is really who they say they are in the wizarding world? Rebellion. Two seconds! Who has time for that? Look, I know Tina wasn't arresting jaywalkers. That's not the implication the film's making here. She's a big girl cop with big girl cases. Okay, sorry, was a big girl cop, or was, was a cop. So when she arrested someone, it must have been for something important. Which leads to my next question. If she arrested half of the bar, as in put them in jail, then why are they out? Did they serve their time? Did they escape? Why does this place, this bar, have wanted posters all over the walls? I bet bad guys brag about their bounties to their friends. Look how much I'm worth! Wizards, they're just like me. Okay, Tina arrested half the bar. That means they're no longer arrested because they're here in the bar. So did they serve their time? Like what constitutes a minor infraction in Magic Land? Like how does a troll get convicted of a felony? Which crimes get you five to 10 years with parole? Wait, does five to 10 years even matter when you're like magic and you live to be a million? Are there prisoners who have been under life sentences since the birth of Jesus? The magic prison industrial complex must make a fortune. I bet they fund local judicial elections to make sure gremlins get harsher sentences. Wait a minute, do they even have courts in sorcery land? There's an earlier scene where Wizard J. Edgar Hoover sentences Tina and Newt to death without a trial. I mean, sure he's obviously corrupt with power and it's implied that this is some sort of breach of protocol, but these two regular, seemingly well-meaning wizard guards just go along with it? Like it's normal? Is this normal that the wizard FBI could just sentence people to death with false conjecture? Okay, that's very realistic. Now, I know what you're thinking. Madeline, don't those other movies have trials? You mean those movies in England? Uh, I would ask you not to compare the majesty that is America to the Shrek swamp that is the United Kingdom. Also, what movies? Okay, so they have the death penalty, but it's not used for every criminal, because at least some of them are out and drinking in a honestly not particularly interesting bar. It's possible they escaped the execution room. I mean, it looks pretty easy to do. Did he just do a spin? Cops are so embarrassing, I swear. So maybe some got out that way. I, I don't know. Others probably went to jail. Did they serve their time? Hell, were they reformed? Tina seems to think they're all just career criminals that go in and out of the system, which is like, wow, Tina, maybe give them a break since they've done what society has asked of them. So I'm going to be fair and say that I think a not insignificant percentage of the people Tina arrested escaped from jail. That's a very reasonable interpretation of what the film is saying. I mean, I can't be the only person who thought that while watching the scene. So wizard prisons must be pretty awful then, huh? Like anyone could just escape from them. That's why they're all here at this speakeasy with wanted posters. Is there like no magical version of Alcatraz they can take criminals to? Like. What would you even call that? I'm not really sure how the judicial system works in Magic Town, but from what we see in the film, it leaves a lot to be desired. For instance, is it standard procedure to bring suspected criminals to meet the wizard president of the United States? Tina doesn't even check Newt for weapons. We know this because she's surprised when his suitcase is filled with delicious treats. What if this suitcase was a wizard bomb? Though I guess this was all before like Wizard 9-11, so security was a lot more lenient. This is so crazy to me, like Tina literally brings a stranger to the wizard president. The only reason she gets in trouble is because she's not an Auror anymore. You made your position here quite clear, Miss Goldstein. Yes, Madam President, but You're I... no longer an Auror. 
So she like still had her job with this being normal? Does the president like to meet every crook before they're sentenced to? I don't even know what magic people are sentenced to. D does she give them like a smooch on the cheek? Is that like their last meal? Do they get like a shot of whiskey? Well, okay, they can't serve whiskey because there's prohibition. Why do wizards have prohibition? Did they also have a concentrated effort by Christian groups to prevent kids from drinking giggle water and I don't know, just farts? Were they worried that magic people would evolve into sin or stop reading the Bible? Do wizards have Bibles? Do wizards pray? Newt does like to say Merlin's beard a lot. Merlin's beard. Is that like saying Jesus Christ? Is Merlin Jesus? Hold on, let me check this. Who wrote this? Oh yeah. We got any other real world parallels to talk about? You fought in the war? Of course I fought in the war. Everyone fought in the war. You don't fight in the war? I work mostly with dragons. Ukrainian iron bellies. <sighs> okay. Okay, what? Why? Why were wizards in World War I? Were they also devastated by the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand? Did they also need an excuse to engage in Imperial conquest? Newt, did you say you trained dragons? I was talking about something. No, don't, don't, don't tell me, I'll think of it. Tina is terrible at her job, though. When her supervisor comes to lecture her, she hides under her desk like a child. She also just drags Newt around New York despite not knowing whether he's a wizard serial killer or whatever. Shockingly, Tina was not punished for just everything about her. It was actually because she attacked a human who abused a child, which I think makes her the first cop in history to be punished for the use of excessive force. Also, it turns out the child she saves is... Oh my god, this... Fucking child. No, no, no. I'm putting my foot down. I'm not talking about the boy. The boy can go die. I'm riding this train. Tina sucks. She's not great. That's what this is about. Tina, why did you go into a speakeasy without a disguise when you arrested half of the people in here? You are literally magic, Tina. Can't you just change how you look? Isn't there some kind of juice that pollies you into someone else? Why did you even go into the illegal magic bar in the first place? I get that you need to find an invisible monkey or something, but was this really the only way to get that information? Was there no other way to figure this out? At least Goblin Ron Perlman didn't give you some bullshit information like, I don't know, but something invisible is happening somewhere. Something invisible has been wreaking havoc around Fifth Avenue. You may want to check out Macy's department store. Okay, I'm sorry, why did no one else in Magic New York know about this? Are wizard cops actually just spread that thin? How did nobody notice the screaming dragon snake above the popular department store? Maybe it was sent as a memo, but it turned into a rat and fought a proposal to make trans marriage legal. Laws are complicated. Oh my god, I'm sorry to think that like humans actually know about wizards, but they're just like playing along to mess with them. They just feel bad. Like some construction worker is watching you put an apartment back together. Like, oh, they're so cute. They think we can't see that. I mean, that would explain why there's an anti-witch cult roaming around in a world that has a memory erasing spell. Maybe the other humans don't like them because they're just spoiling the fun. I mean, I get it. Like, what monster would tell a child there's no Santa Claus? Did I explain why I'm distinguishing between humans and wizards? It's because Newt says this. See, so you're a muggle. So our physiologies are subtly different. <laughs> Who is this guy? Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is not actually about the misadventures of the world's worst cop, but it's actually about a guy trying to, like, find his missing dogs. So he's the real reason I came to America. To bring Frank home. Yeah, that. Anyway, this is Newt. Newt is a bit of an explorer? I'm more of a chaser, really. Right, sorry. Anyway, uh, Newt the chaser is trying to... I'm sorry, it's what? What the heck's Quidditch? You know I don't like sports. They got a lot of chasers in Quidditch. Three? On every team. That's a lot of chasers. I think that's too many chasers. 
Okay, so Newt, who I guess was a chaser in high school, is trying to find his animals, and that's what the movie is about, right? Look, friends, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you've fallen for bad marketing. Despite what the title wants us to believe, this film is not actually about fantastic beasts and or where you can find them. If this was supposed to be wizard Pokemon, then why is so much screen time spent on political intrigue, abusive religious cults, abusive magic cults, this guy, whoever she is? I mean, they do catch rad animals, but that's just something they happen to do. It keeps them busy between more important scenes, like this kid being sad, or this... the. Senate race. Is that William Randolph Hearst? Here's a more accurate summary. Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them is an anthology film with 50 stories happening at the same time. These include Newt Scamander, who wants to let a big bird free in Arizona, Wizard Hitler, who escaped from prison and is all about town, a religious cult hates magic. A smoke monster is destroying New York City. Wizard J. Edgar Hoover is trying to find the Chosen One. This sad child, the son of a newspaper tycoon, is running for a re-election in the Senate while the Senator's brother is a washed-up loser trying to live up to his father's expectations. Wizard Pokemon. Wait, I, I just remember what this video is about. So Tina is not disguised at an illegal magician bar surrounded by her enemies in order to find out there's some invisible shit happening in a highly populated area. Amazing. But twist, turns out this was a sting operation. Goblin Ron Perlman sold them out. The cops are raiding the bar. Oh no, get out, heroes. This scene is fascinating to me because Goblin Ron Perlman's career as a gangster is officially over. Bro is already an informant, a thing criminals do not like, but now he's called the cops on his own bar? I mean, this speakeasy no longer exists. It is closed down, and there's no way Goblin Ron Perlman's getting another one. He just snitched on his whole clientele. Nobody's gonna work with him again. He's been killed off screen. He's sleeping with the ghost fishes. Everyone in the wizarding world has the brain of a toddler. There's no other rationalization. It also explains why wizards shat their pants until someone told them you could just crap in a hole. It's it's because they're babies. Hey, precious, you know you don't have to whisk your turds away with magic, right? You don't have to feel that soft caress go down your legs and shake it out. That's so insane to me that wizards used to yeet their poop. Not just because it's gross, which it is, but like... The sheer decadence of it. Wizards can't be bothered to take off their pants. They just wish their excrement away to the cornfield. Did they pee themselves too? Of course they did. They have magic to clean themselves. Unless the germs are magic too. They're all just privileged little shits. For example, Jacob here is a human trying to open his own bakery but can't get a loan from the bank. He has worked for years honing his craft, learning new recipes, and expanding on his dear grandmother's delectable creations passed down from generation to generation. And then we have Queenie. Queenie is... Flapper Girl coded? She's Audrey from Little Shop of Horrors. She tells Jacob that she likes to cook too. And then she waves her wand and the most incredible strudel of all time materializes before the mortal Jacob. Jacob says it's the greatest thing he's ever tasted. This meal, it's insanely good. The greatest meal I've ever had in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and Queenie just looks at him like someone looks at a particularly cute cockroach. What she made was probably the equivalent of a decent bachelorette pad Wednesday night for wizards, but to the human Jacob, it was orgasmic. Queenie's interest in him is told to us by the film to be flirtatious and based in mutual respect, but there's no hint of that anywhere. Jacob is essentially a dog to her, and how can he be anything else to God? Oh, you slay me. I ain't never really talked to a nomad before. Let's look at another scene. I know that you have rather backwards laws about relations with non-magic people. That you're not meant to befriend them, that you can't marry them, which seems mildly absurd to me. Who's gonna marry him? Honestly, I'm with Tina on this one. Not the bigotry, but, well, the general idea she's trying to say. In modern times, wizards can marry all the humans they want. There are thousands of mixed magic couples, and that honestly sounds terrifying. Can you even comprehend the power imbalance in those relationships? The status of one is so much higher than the other that it leads me to think of comparisons I'm not allowed to say with this complexion. Remember how wizards have memory erasing spells? They can literally erase anything they don't want their partner to remember. The advances in gaslighting and abuse are astronomical. 
comical. The monstrous things the wizard could do to a human, it's so horrendous I really don't want to think about it. Newt should be in prison. I'm more of a chaser, really. Newt's commander, amateur chaser, is terrible. He's the worst thing that happened to magic creatures since the magic meteor killed all the magic dinosaurs. Mr. Scamander walks around New York with a broken suitcase that does not close. Not lock, close. So the animals inside of it get out, like all the time. That's why they have to find the Fantastic Beasts. Newt keeps letting them escape. Though can you blame the poor things? They live in an absolute mess of a sanctuary. Rare and nearly extinct monsters can just walk around and hang out with whoever they want. Like these bigger monsters who just want to eat them. Survival of the fittest, baby! I get that Newt isn't technically a professional, and I guess he's inventing the concept of magical creature conservation as he goes. But like, this is bad by like, old LA Zoo standards. Also, why does Newt have so many animals that steal things? This monster only takes shiny things, this guy picks locks, this monkey shoplifts, hell, even some of the animals shit treasure. Is there a case to be made that Newt's commander is actually a con artist masquerading as an animal activist? I mean, it's not not there. He can't even remember all his animals. I thought I had them all, but uh, must have miscounted. I'm guessing he loses like five unicorns a day. Okay, look, I get it. I know he has to misplace the animals in order to look for them. Otherwise, there wouldn't be any Fantastic Beasts to find. It's not like this movie could have been about, say, Magical Congress calling Newt to look for a bunch of monsters wrecking New York and capturing them. How would you even fit the Senate race into that? So, in conclusion, that's why the stuff I said. Remember that local elections are far more important in affecting your immediate circumstances than national ones. I'm gonna poop. So what? I know that's what you're thinking. Oh no, a fantasy movie doesn't make 100% sense. Congratulations, Madeline. You've found a pretty mid movie and made a CinemaSins video about it. Round of applause for the genius, I guess. And you're right, this is all super petty. I mean, why did I do this? I mean, I, I guess I, I just, I keep coming back to that line. I've arrested half of the people in here. I mean, I've, I've seen bad movies and I've heard bad lines, but this, this combination here, Fantastic Beasts, and this line, I've arrested half of the people in here. There's just something about it that I can't get out of my brain. I really just don't want to make a CinemaSins video. I hope there's something else here. And then I had a thought, perhaps an intrusive thought. What if Fantastic Beasts disproves God? First, let's consider how little the movie thinks of its own world. I hope I showed that thoroughly enough in part one. Fantastic Beasts can have a line like, I've arrested half of the people in here, and move on because the movie doesn't care. You find this everywhere in Fantastic Beasts. What does an or do? Heck if I know. Can he just magic pies into existence? Sure, why not? Why didn't anyone in New York hear the screams of that snake dragon? Because, you know, shut up, that's why. Fantastic Beasts is a series of contradictory ideas, both big and small, that don't work together as a whole, let alone piece by piece. Sure, we need to have some suspension of disbelief when we watch a movie. A film wouldn't make much sense unless we believe that, say, a cut from one scene to the next is probably moving forward in time. But Fantastic Beasts is not just asking us to go with the flow. It's gaslighting us into believing we are watching a world that's feasible. If you've gotten anything from the video so far, I hope it's that the wizarding world is anything but feasible. But if you're still not convinced that any of this is a big deal, let's look at some of the themes and ideas the film tries to express. Animal conservation. Newt wants to protect animals. He wants to raise awareness of their plights. The film constantly tells us how good he is with animals. On paper, it seems like his goals are noble. Except 
Well, he's actually really, really bad at caring for magical beasts. His suitcase is broken and opens all the time. You know, that's why the beasts are on the loose. You know, they escape his poorly constructed portable zoo. I mean, think about that within the context of what we know are the actual major hurdles of environmental protection. The conflict of magical animals running rampant in New York is not caused by industrialization or poor government oversight. The, you know, the stuff we should be worried about. It's because Newt was negligent. This in itself could be a great example of how human arrogance can lead to the destruction of the environment, but Newt is not the villain of this story. He's the hero, and he faces no repercussions for any of his actions. Fantastic Beast is arguing that Newt I'm more of a chaser, really. should do whatever he wants regardless of the consequences. Sure, he lets his animals loose in a large city, but it's fun and funny and it led to all the characters meeting each other, so really, who are we to judge? I mean, heck, if Newt didn't own all those snake dragons, like, you know, the one that almost ate our heroes, he wouldn't have been able to give Jacob their magical silver eggs. Newt says he wants to protect animals from poachers who would make money off of them, but, you know, he's doing the exact same thing. Fantastic Beast is saying it's okay for one person to have an outsized influence on the environment as long as they're good. Maybe if we had Newt Scamander instead of J.D. Rockefeller, none of this global warming stuff would have happened. That's really all that's being said here. Newt isn't arguing for anything other than animals should be protected. He's not specific on how or why. It's just because he says so. Let the audience fill in the details themselves. It's, it's very hollow. I would argue that the film believes less in environmentalism than it does nature should be controlled by cool people. Like Newt, Newt should have all the animals because according to the film, he's cool, I guess. I mean, not very competent, just the movie likes him, it kind of chose him to be the one. You know, so because of that, Newt gets to be pretty awful with animals. But, you know, he's good with animals? It's very strange. If the film is trying to comment on how we don't question authority, then Newt is a great villain, but the audience is clearly supposed to see him as the hero. Newt is the king of beasts because the film says he is. None of his dangerous actions have real consequences, and that's a big problem. Politics. Despite a large chunk of the film being about political intrigue and corruption, Fantastic Beasts has very little to say about it. Most it can muster is bad politics are the product of bad people, which is just the same argument as we heard about environmentalism. I've talked a lot about how the specifics of the wizard governing system in America are vague, and I think that's because the film doesn't care about them. Stuff just kind of happens because it moves the story along, not because it's a good way to carry out the law. There could very well be courts in Magic Congress, but they're not important to see in this film, at least because that decision is going to come from someone with authority anyway. Why not just skip all that? Have the president or the FBI decide that? When Magic J. Edgar Hoover sentences Newt and Tina to death, we're not supposed to think of the system that allowed this to happen. We're supposed to think about how Hoover, who is actually Grindelwald, or Wizard Hitler, should not have this job, because he's bad. When the president orders the cops to kill the wizard boy, we aren't supposed to question the power the president has here. We're supposed to wish for a better president. Or worse, I guess we're supposed to assume this must have been the best possible outcome because a person in authority made it. According to the film, power deserves to be in the hands of the worthy. If someone screws it up, then we replace them with someone more worthy. We never question the system that keeps making all these amazing people do terrible things. The position of magical J. Edgar Hoover can't be bad in and of itself. It has to be because Johnny Depp turned into Colin Farrell and took over his job. If that didn't happen, everything would be fine. Probably. Religious fanaticism. There's a plot line about a Christian cult slash orphanage thing that's trying to expose witches to the world. The real world context is that the writer of Fantastic Beasts is taking pot shots at all the people who said Harry Potter was the devil. That's my theory at least. 
but what purpose does this cult serve in the film itself? They are indeed a condemnation of religion, or at least religions that take things too far. The second Salemers are evil, abusive. All they do is talk about witches. They're as one-dimensional as a film with 500 stories demands them to be. There's this girl who only has like three lines, but most of them are just this one nursery rhyme about killing witches. My mommy, your mama gonna catch a witch. My mommy, your mama flying on a switch. My mommy, your mama flying on a switch. My mommy, your mama, witches never fly. It's like the film knows how far down this plot is in our minds, so it has to remind us who these people are every time we cut to them. They also serve as the catalyst for a Magic Boy's transformation. Remember Magic Boy? I mentioned him earlier. Magic Boy turns out to be this bad thing doing bad things in New York. You know, at, at least when it's not Newt's animals. See, Magic Boy's foster parents hated magic, so he suppressed who he was so hard that his negative emotions became a parasite that took him over. The message is simple. If you force someone to be something they're not, it will ultimately destroy them. Did anyone just feel a breeze right now? But under that is the same story we've been talking about this whole time. Only the powerful are worthy of respect, and the powerful are always wizards. For instance, we learn nothing about the non-magical kids in the orphanage who are clearly being abused as well. There's this one girl who's a red herring, you know, the rhyming one, but once it's revealed that the actual magic kid was Magic Boy, she disappears from the film. Now that we know she's human, she has no more reason to exist. This could also be a byproduct of the film having too many plot threads. We don't have time to focus on the orphanage or the children for any substantial amount of time, but it doesn't really matter why it turned out this way. The message, intentional or not, is consistent with everything else. The people who are important are the people with magic. Everyone else is expendable. Racism. The most background of the plots is that Grindelwald is around and he believes that wizards should rule over humans. He risked the exposure of our community. He has broken one of our most sacred a laws. A law that has us scuttling like rats in the gutter. A law that demands that we conceal our true nature. Who does this law protect? Us? Or them? This whole bit is fascinating to me because we are supposed to think this man is wrong, but the film actually supports everything he says. Magic people are the best people ever. That's what all the previous themes taught us. Newt sucks at taking care of animals, but he's a wizard, so, you know, it's fine. Tina is a terrible cop, but she's a wizard cop, so she's amazing by existing. Sure, sometimes there are bad wizards, but you just have to get rid of those. The system works. Sure, the same system suppresses humans, but that's good in this world because humans are dumb and they suck. Except Jacob, maybe? Well, he's a big goofy comic relief, so that's fine. Why is he in the film again? Why did you keep me around? Because I like you. Because you're my friend. Oh, right. Newt likes him. Jacob is a pet. I think the point of Fantastic Beasts is to be awestruck by its mere existence. When you think about how haphazard these lines are, how messy and convoluted all its different stories are, I can only conclude that their function is less important than their presence. This whole video has been about how nonsensical lines and scenes in Fantastic Beasts are, but it's important to understand that, to the film, it doesn't really matter. The movie continues to its destination either way, and that makes it really hard to care about anything that's happening. How can we determine what matters when nothing matters? How do we know when anyone is in danger when we don't understand what is considered dangerous? There's a scene where Jacob attempts to touch an Obscurus, this evil floating ball of black smoke, and Newt tells him sternly to step away. Step back. Step back. The implication here is that the Obscurus is dangerous, and if Jacob touched it, something bad would happen to him. But then later in the film, Magic J. Edgar Hoover pulls it out of Newt's suitcase, and Newt says that it can't harm anyone. It could not hurt anyone, Tina. So now we have to assume we were wrong about the earlier scene. Perhaps the danger wasn't to Jacob, but to the Obscurus itself? 
like touching it would make it disappear or something. But the wizard FBI had no problem handling it. Heck, we never see this Obscurus again, so what was the point of all this? So little care is put into these small moments that they easily contradict large chunks of the film when you think about them for more than a second. This isn't just a failure to proofread your work, it's a failure of effort. This isn't just bad writing, this is insulting writing. These are not decisions made from good judgment. They're decrees from a queen who treats her audience with contempt. Why does Tina hide behind her desk when her supervisor shows up? Because it's funny, to me, the person writing it. It's the same reason Tina opens a suitcase and it's filled with pastries. Because it's funny, does it make sense beyond that? Does it raise questions you don't want your audience thinking about? Does it make you want to rethink having your cop lady take a mysterious man to see the president? No, of course not. I am the writer, and if I wrote it, it must be good, because I wrote it. I've talked about the plot line with the evil religious cult that wants to expose magic, but it's so separated from everything else happening in the film that you could cut the film in half and nothing would change on either side. And that's kind of insane, right? That you could remove one of the two biggest stories in Fantastic Beasts and still have a complete movie. There's some tangential connections the film puts in to try and tie them together, like Tina being demoted for saving Magic Boy in the orphanage with magic, or Grindelwald using that same child to find a different child. But that's it. Each story serves as vague background noise for the other story. Nothing makes sense in the wizarding world. Not Nude as an animal rights advocate, not Tina as a cop, not the magical government as a convincing political body, not the judicial system as an effective means of trying and incarcerating criminals, not anything. Yet the film still gets all the outcomes it wants. Everything that Fantastic Beasts wants to happen does happen, even though on paper this should all be impossible. Why is that? Because the movie sucks? Sure, obviously, but even the worst scripts usually exist within a feasible reality. The Room is a bad movie, but it's a bad movie that takes place in a real world, you know, our world. Fantastic Beast World, by its own standards, by its own rules, by its own lore, is an impossible world. It should not be able to exist as described. It must have help. That's what's so interesting here. The Wizarding World isn't powered by magic, it's powered by faith. I got this, um, uh, Fantastic Beast Wand when I saw the film at an early screening, if you can see that. Uh, it's supposed to be Newt's Wand. Here it is here. Uh, I don't know, does that look accurate to the people at home? It's very strong. It's got a good, um, weight to it. It's really well made. Fantastic Beast uses something I'm going to call Bible logic. In many religious texts, actions and outcomes don't always happen naturally. The decisions of a character and their corresponding consequences are the product of deities. Things work because God wills them to work. The story of Noah makes sense because God wills it to make sense. The same thing happens in Fantastic Beasts. Newt puts an apartment back together and nobody sees it. Did he get lucky? A magic rhino runs through New York and nobody sees it. What are the odds? Humans and wizards both can't hear the giant snake dragon in a public place. Tina doesn't get immediately shot at a bar where every criminal knows her because she arrested them. Jacob doesn't get his memory erased until the very moment when it doesn't matter anymore. The second Salemers don't get their memory erased despite being a large concern for wizards. How is all this possible? Incompetence? Chance? I mean, maybe the first few times, but over and over again? That's not luck. That's a miracle. The wizarding world does not work without divine intervention. Horrors only make sense if there are no small-time wizard crooks. 
Tina only gets out of the speakeasy alive because none of the people she arrested wanted revenge on her. Tina brings a suspected criminal to the president and it's fine. Tina is sentenced to death without a trial and none of her co-workers bat an eye when carrying out her execution. Thousands of humans know about magic, but none of them accidentally spilled the beans. Many of them have, you know, magic babies that could, example, accidentally make a pane of glass disappear in a snake exhibit. But nobody catches on. The only way this makes any kind of sense if there was a god forcing it all to work. And I think that's fascinating. The Wizarding World wants so badly to be a real place you can imagine yourself going to, but it can't even exist by its own laws. Like a religious text, little can happen without the involvement of a god. A god specifically with a point of view. We can take this idea all the way back to those original books. Harry Potter was always fate dependent, but it didn't matter because we were following the adventures of a single child from his point of view. It's the archetypal example of a hero's journey narrative. Everything within Harry's world exists for him and because of him. Why does the secret position, a position that turns the whole sport into a farce, exist in Quidditch? So Harry Potter can have it and be the most important sportsman ever. You catch this, Potter, and we win. Why does poverty exist in a world where everything is done with magic, so Harry can leave it and enter prosperity? Why are there no math classes at Hogwarts? Because Harry used to have to do boring subjects like that, but now he lives in a power fantasy where nobody has to do algebra and he can eat cake and ice cream for breakfast. The Wizarding World is what happens when you take the hero's journey and make it the basis of an entire universe's structure. The lore of Harry Potter was never meant to be taken beyond the walls of Hogwarts and beyond Harry's own sight. If your story is self-contained, you can get away with a lot more inconsistencies. When Harry Potter is about Harry Potter, the magic boarding school student, works great. When it's about anything else, it falls flat on its face. The story is at its strongest and most appealing when it's at Hogwarts. There's a reason that latest really popular wizard video game took place at Hogwarts. There's a reason why Fantastic Beast takes a moment to talk about Hogwarts. Is there a school? The wizardry school here in uh, America? Of course. Ilvermorny. It's only the best wizard school in the whole world. I think you'll find that the best wizarding school in the world is Hogwarts. There's a reason why Fantastic Beasts 2 has an extended sequence in Hogwarts. Harry Potter is at its best when it's at Hogwarts because Hogwarts was designed for Harry Potter. The Wizarding World shows that you cannot base a society around one boy's fantasy. Seeker is a fun position to think about, but if something like that was in a real sport, no one would watch it because it's broken. It's escapism to imagine oneself becoming suddenly rich overnight, but when everyone can use magic for everything, what's the point of having currency at all? You don't need to pay your broom to sweep. By all accounts, wizards should live in a classless, money-free society, but they don't, because the writer of these stories thinks it's more fun to imagine yourself being better and superior to everyone else, because that's the fantasy. And the best way to show that you're better than everyone else is to have more things than anyone else. When we're only talking about kids at a magic camp, it's okay if the world building isn't bulletproof. The problem is Fantastic Beasts and the Wizarding World at large forces us to look at these weaker elements. It really, really wants us to see its world as just as real and believable as our own. But it's not. Like, the original books were about giving one kid cool things. Polyjuice Potion is fine when it's just Harry getting into trouble, but when we're forced to believe the Wizarding World could actually exist, then you have to think about why grown-ass adults don't use it when going to a magic speakeasy. And if there's a spell that reveals people who use Polyjuice Potion, then you have to think about how nobody thought to use that as a safety measure for wizards entering a secure building like Magical Congress. Everyone should have to have that spell blasted at them before going inside. It doesn't work, it shouldn't work, but it does anyway. I remember years ago, I watched this debate between a bunch of Christian fundamentalists and atheists. The atheists challenged the Christians to prove that evolution wasn't real without invoking God. And they couldn't do it. They broke the rule almost immediately. 
I'm not here to tell you why I don't believe God exists. I'm here to tell you why I believe he failed at his premise to prove that God exists scientifically without invoking the Bible. Um, most of us know the Ten Commandments are in the Bible, so we probably should leave the building right now. The Ten Commandments were used wholly here as part of his proof. The point was that if you have to use God to explain your science, then your science doesn't work. Because at that point, you're not trying to convince anyone, you're forcing them to believe you. To invoke God is to end all discussion, because by default, no argument can top that. It's God. God is all-powerful. God is invisible. God can make something happen, then hide all the evidence that they were ever there. God is unquestionable, so it's not an interesting argument. Also, God isn't real, at least not in the sense we're talking about them. Look, I'm not here to disprove all religions. I'm only here to disprove one religion, one God. I should be more specific because we know who God is in Fantastic Beasts. It's the author. It's J.K. Rowling. Rowling is not God. Rowling is a writer, a human being playing God within her own made up world. This is true for all creators, but What's interesting about Fantastic Beasts is how much the film reminds us of her presence. We call these plot holes in other media, but here they happen so often and consistently, I have to imagine some sort of, let's say, intelligent design. The characters don't feel like living, thinking people. They feel like pawns destined to their fates. Newt is the animal guy. Does it matter whether he's good at it or not? Tina is going to get the information they need from that speakeasy, so it really doesn't matter if they wear disguises. They're going to survive it anyway. Why bother with pretenses? Who cares if the believability is shaky? The outcome is always going to be the same. I feel like here, Rowling is even less a god and probably more like a queen. Because queens can do and say whatever they want because no one is going to go against the will of their ruler because if they did, they would be killed. Fantastic Beast feels like a royal's fever dream in that sense, if everything they decreed became not only real, but made the world better. But you know, that's not how the world works, like at all. A queen can ask for whatever she wants, but if it's not possible, she's not going to get it. And if a queen asks for something that her subjects do not like, they're not gonna take it lightly. Yet, Rowling has invented a world where a ruler can say, let them eat cake, and it will actually make everything better. Miss Rowling, if you want us, the audience, to believe that Harry Potter could be a real place we could go to if it existed, then okay, let's talk about it like it's a real place. What's it like to live in the wizarding world? It's depressing. Let's do another example. Because, I mean, we've already done so many. What's one more, right? Remember when I talked about Queenie making that strudel out of thin air? You ever wonder how food works in Harry Potter? I remember Hogwarts had these gigantic orgy-like buffets. It's a lot of food to prepare every day for a few hundred children. Where did it come from? You might think they magic it all into existence. I certainly did. But we do have a canon answer. According to the Harry Potter fan wiki, one, food cannot be created with magic, and two, the meals at Hogwarts are prepared by house elves and transported magically to the tables in the banquet hall. And that's it. That's the answer. But where does the food come from? Saying that food comes from the kitchen is the most naive, privileged answer imaginable. If this is the end of your inquiry, you have never worked a day in your life. Still confused? Keep your refrigerator empty and see how long it takes for a cheese sandwich to appear. I post this same question to my more wizard literate peers, and their answers were incredibly telling to the ideology this series embeds in you. They get it from the grocery store. Well, then where does the grocery store get it? Hogwarts has a garden. The school serves full course meals for hundreds of kids three times a day. This garden would have to be gigantic. We would have heard about it. Maybe they have farms? Okay, this one seems like the most plausible, but it does open another can of worms because now we have to ask, who works on these farms? 
my guess, house elves, slaves. These are plantations, basically. It's either that or casting a spell to make your plow work for you. It's probably both. Now with all that supposing out of the way, remember we don't know any of these answers for sure, here's where things get really weird. Wizards have a duplication spell. And guess what? It works on food. You could just duplicate food forever. Why, this sounds too good to be true. Certainly there must be some drawbacks. It gets rotten a bit faster. That's not a good reason to not duplicate food indefinitely. If you have two cheese sandwiches and one is going to go bad in three days instead of five days, you have two good cheese sandwiches. Maybe eating duplicate food makes you sick or kills you? I mean, not that I could find. Please let me know in the comments if I'm wrong about this, because all I could pull up was that it just might not last quite as long. So why does any of this matter? It sounds like I'm having a semantics argument. A, a silly nerd debate with super fans. Who cares about the specifics of food duplications? Well, if magic can essentially make infinite food, then there shouldn't be any poor people in Harry Potter. And yet there are quite a few poor people in Harry Potter. The Weasley family is famous for being poor. Ha! Another Weasley. Their problems shouldn't exist. Hell, money shouldn't exist. Why do you need currency when you can do anything ever with magic. There should be no capitalism. Money is meaningless. The Weasleys are described as living in a shack. If Newt Scamander can recreate an apartment with a flick of his wrist, that's impossible. It should just be a nice house. Newt Scamander isn't special. He isn't an architect. He's an amateur zookeeper. At least things can't get any more ridiculous. Wrong! Because even if you did find some sort of evidence stating that eating duplicate food is bad for you, it turns out you can conjure some food into existence. That's right! Harry Potter lied to us! In addition, while good food could not be conjured, consumable things such as sauces, wine, and potable water could be, as they were not particularly nutritious substances. Okay, there is a lot to unpack there. Can we reflect on how monstrously out of touch JK Rowling is if she doesn't consider water to be particularly nutritious? And hey, guess what? If you can conjure wine, you can conjure food. Wine is grapes. Are you telling me that it's impossible to conjure grapes, but you can conjure the complex fermented version of grapes? You can conjure grapes. Also, what does nutritious mean? Do you mean healthy? Like you can't conjure a hamburger, but you can conjure a Big Mac? Maybe it means filling? How are you defining filling, Rolling? Says here you can conjure sauces. Does that include ranch? Ranch is pretty filling. When does sauce become soup? Okay, here's an easy one. If you can conjure ketchup, why can't you conjure tomatoes? If you can conjure tomatoes and water, you can conjure tomato soup. I am not breaking the law. This is what I mean when I say the wizarding world is depressing. They have the resources and abilities to prevent poverty and hunger. Hell, these things shouldn't even exist in Harry Potter. But they still do. It's like everyone is consciously choosing the worst possible options when a better solution is really flippin' easy. I just glanced at a fan wiki and I figured it out. So why is it like this? Or I guess, better question, why is the wizarding world allowed to be like this? Why doesn't everyone rise up and spark a revolution? Well, because Harry Potter isn't real. Rowling is the god of her world, so she can decide if her characters question these decisions or not. I mentioned before that Newt and company feel more like board game pieces being manipulated to achieve a specific goal. Nobody's actions really make sense and the consequences, or lack thereof, are even more perplexing. They don't have agency, they don't have free will, they have predetermined fates. Like saints in a bible. J.K. Rowling has made a wizarding world that isn't too different from the one she and many of us live in today. Wizards still have capitalism, they still have hierarchy, they still have a false meritocracy, just with magic and a few fun little pickups to spice things up. To Rowling, these concepts are as natural as the sun in the sky. They happen regardless of the world around them. Money is like rain, it's everywhere. But Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them reveals the truth. 
This film is so poorly conceived that it actually proves that all these ideas I've been talking about aren't natural at all. Because in the universe that is the wizarding world, capitalism fails the god test. You cannot explain why these Western imperialist concepts exist without invoking a higher power. Fantastic Beast is literally asked, why are wizards like this? And answers with, a different wizard did it. And again, we know who God is here. It's rolling. She is the one saying she did it. She is the other wizard. She is not an invisible force in the sky. Her characters may not be able to comprehend her, but we can. We can see her. We can call bullshit. If Rowling is the god of Harry Potter, then Fantastic Beasts disproves Rowling. It tears the curtain away to reveal a moral human. Rowling is not god because no one is god. Rowling is a queen, and much like the royalty of old, Rowling sees the systems in which she lives under, the same ones that made her a billionaire, as unchangeable. Poverty and hierarchy are as natural as rain and snow. But this isn't the Middle Ages. We know that queens weren't appointed by God. So what about the mysterious force that made Rowling? What about capitalism? I'm not sure I'm strong enough to compare capitalism to God in this video, but it's impossible for me to not see some similarities between them, at least in the context we've been talking about. We see the same sorts of people benefit under our social structures. It doesn't seem random. There is a sense of bias. Think of it this way. If you can't prove something by invoking God, then you can't prove God by invoking God. It's all equal and fair. So can we look at our world, our way of life, and call it natural? Can we do so without using God? Or do we have to invoke a queen of some kind? Religion is a system. Royalty is a system. Systems are created by people. People created capitalism. People decided who were chosen by God. People decided God. God cannot be God because no one can be God. God can only be people. If a queen says they are God, then what they're really saying is they are people. And that's everyone. J.K. Rowling isn't any more special than anybody else. I don't know, maybe if Rowling wants to prove her right to rule, she could invoke capitalism. this video with a funny fact I found out while making it. This whole time I've been talking about Tina and the gang going to a magic speakeasy, but it turns out it's not a speakeasy at all. See, there was no prohibition for wizards in the 1920s. It was considered though because, and I swear this is real, there were some wizards that thought if people saw wizards stumbling around drunk they would get suspicious. Like, Oh my god, wizards actually thought like a human would see them drunk and go, Magic man, that's impossible. That's, I, I have no words for that. Wizards are truly incredible. Like everything else in this franchise, this scene only works because its creator forced it to work. There is nothing natural about a speakeasy in a world where alcohol is legal. But if that's what the queen wants, then so be it. There is now a speakeasy in a world where alcohol is legal. I spent this whole video wondering why I was so obsessed with the single goofy line, but it really has nothing to do with its quality. What fascinates me about the line is that it shouldn't exist. Nothing in Fantastic Beasts should exist. The speakeasy might as well be Noah's Ark for all the sense it makes. And that's what this movie is. That's what this franchise is. An impossible speakeasy. Why is the line, I arrested half of the people in here so fascinating to me? Because nobody could have said it. so much for watching this video. Um, if you liked this thing, uh, check out my Patreon at um, Friendly Cat Life. I think the link's gonna be in the description down below. Uh, you can be a contributor, like the name somewhere. 
uh, on here. And I want to give a special uh, shout out, Patreon shout out to Gomer. Thanks a lot, buddy. I really appreciate it. Um, if you like this, like, share, and subscribe. Uh, ask a question in the comments. Uh, tell me what your favorite uh, wizard fact is. I've made a lot of mine here. Uh, the, the poop one is still, I think, my favorite. Um, yeah, thank you all uh, so much again, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. I'm more of a chaser, really. <laughs>